Welcome to the Covered Bridges of New Hampshire podcast, where we discuss all things related to covered bridges in the Granite State. Here's your host, Kim Chandler. Hello, Covered Bridge people, and welcome to the podcast. Today, we're talking with Master Bridge Wright Arnold M. Grayton of Holderness. Arnold has been restoring covered bridges since the early 1950s, when he began doing site work alongside his late father, Milton S. Grayton, as a full partner of Grayton Associates. The two utilized traditional methods to restore these national landmarks and signified the beginning of a revival of utilizing 19th century construction methods to both restore and build new covered bridges. Over the past 70 or so years, Arnold and his crew have restored almost 70 historic covered bridges across the country. The late David Wright, former president of the National Society for the Preservation of Covered Bridges, once said, I can't think of any builders who've done as much for covered bridge work as the Graytons. The original bridges would have been erased. They might have looked like covered bridges, but because they wouldn't have been renovated exactly how they were built, they wouldn't have been the same. In addition to restoring old covered bridges, Arnold and his crew have constructed 16 new covered bridges, including eight in New Hampshire. His restoration efforts preserve the historical integrity of the bridges and employ, in his own words, as much of the same technology from years ago that we can to preserve the craft and a bit of history. Arnold himself made history in 1969 with the construction of the Middle Bridge in Woodstock, Vermont. This was the first new town latticed covered bridge constructed in the United States in the 20th century using 19th century methods. Three years later, Arnold would construct the New England College Bridge in Henniker, which marked the first authentic new covered bridge constructed in New Hampshire since 1907. For the record, Arnold's work extends beyond covered bridges. He and his team restore churches, old barns, fire towers, remote mountain huts, and other historic landmarks, such as the Shelburne Museum barn, the Eagle Block in Newport, and the Mayflower too the replica of the ship that brought the ancestors of many of the old carpenters and bridge rights to America in the first place. Arnold Dem Grayton Associates has led covered bridge preservation efforts across the country for decades. Arnold's team includes Don Walker, Arnold's wife, Meg Dancero, and his stepson, Tim Dancero. In New Hampshire, Arnold and his crew have restored more than half of the historic covered bridges and constructed the Turkey Gym, Corbin, Bump, New England College, Packard Hill, Squam River, Jack O'Lantern, and Stony Moral Bridges. A full listing of Arnold's projects is listed in the show notes. Arnold Grayton is the foremost authority on covered bridges in the country and has built and restored more covered bridges than any other bridge right. His impact on the New Hampshire covered bridge community is without precedence. And if you know Arnold, you know he's a man of few words. It was truly an honor to interview him. Here we go. Well, welcome to the podcast, Arnold. Thank you. Glad to be here. I wanted to start our podcast out today by asking you about something that you once said to me. And you said, not every bridge with a roof is a covered bridge. A true covered bridge is a masterpiece of architecture. Can you explain a little bit more about what you meant by that? Well, to, to start off with a, a true covered bridge has side trusses that carry the load. And uh, often now we have to, well, maybe not often, but sometimes they, we have to carry heavier loads than what the bridge is designed, designed for. So they take the floor system out and put a concrete and steel or a combination of steel and wood. And that deck is what carries the load. So you still have to call that an authentic covered bridge because the side trusses are there. Just modern man's decided to make them useless but on the other hand the bridge that is just a cover over a concrete 
roadway, even though it might look like a truss, it's not a working truss, never could work. So that's not, a, in my opinion, that's not really a covered bridge. That's a cover over a bridge. Thank you for explaining that. I think it's something that I've learned and I like to share with others is that just because it's a wooden bridge with a cover on it does not make it an authentic covered bridge. It's a hard line to, to draw, you know, where you don't want to make it too strict to definition so that you lose people's interest in covered bridges, but you don't want to just allow anything to be a, you know, if it's a tobacco bound with the doors open, you don't want to call it a covered bridge. <laughs> How did you get your start working on covered bridges? Well, it all started about the time I got out of high school. We had all this flood control dams going in and that sort of thing. Along with soon after that, the highways were being widened for more traffic. And, uh, quite often in the flood control here at the covered bridge was down in the floodplain, so it had to be moved out. And in the process, of course, we had to do enough repairs to the covered bridge so that it could be moved because they were 100 years old and been neglected, not intentionally, but neglected during that time. And it's a long story, but you know, modern traffic brings a lot more dirt water into a bridge than the hoss and buggy did. Mm -hmm. So that got us started moving, moving them and repairing them and just evolved from there. We were asked to build the Turkey Gym Bridge. The Turkey Gym, was that the first project that you and your father worked on? Uh, best I can recall, yeah. As far as, as far as building a new, we I think we had worked on Blair just on some minor repairs, you know, a plank here and there that needed to be replaced, that sort of thing before that. And the Turkey Gym Bridge in Campton, did you go to fix the bridge and found it wasn't fixable, so you had to build a new one? How, how did you come to build a new bridge there? Yeah, that, that was pretty much it, of course. So, Again, it was heavier loads they wanted to bring across it, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not sure if they had built the motel then or it was the, that was anticipated, but it was right in that time that they wanted to, instead of just one citizen going across with his pickup truck, now it had to be a lot more traffic, you know. Right, right. So, uh, Best I can remember, that's when we found there was rot on the end cords and what, things like that. And okay. It just needed to be uploaded. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In 1972, you took the lead of the construction of the New England College Bridge in Henniker, which marked the first authentic new covered bridge constructed in New Hampshire since 1907. What does it mean to be an authentic covered bridge? I'm not sure when that started, if I realized what part I was going to play in it. It kind of developed into that, you know, as time went on. But right. It was, it was uh, quite an honor to see it when it was all finished and over the river, and knowing that it was a unique project. What makes it authentic is that it was a true copy of Ithiel Town's town lattice, the wooden trunnels and no, not a lot of metal fasteners to hold the trusses of uh, wood. Do you build everything by, by hand for the most part, or do you, do, you, do you use modern tools when you build a bridge? What does that look like for you? Yeah, we... I like to use hand tools, but you, the world won't wait for you to do everything by hand, you know. Right. So, you know, so we we use modern tools, you know, but we still uh, 
develop the same project. You know, the joinery mm -hmm. is all dressed by hand to fit. You know, the chain modesta and things like that get it roughed out quickly, but then you have to dress it with slicks and heads and that sort of thing to make sure it's a true fit. I'm assuming all of the covered bridges that you've constructed, but I know for many you've you've pulled them across the river using oxen. Is I would imagine that's a more comp complicated process than having a crane come in and just plop the bridge where it needs to go. Can you talk about why why you use that method? Well, if you if you build in a replica of an antique, then why not? go that much further <laughs> right. and show the folks that are interested how it was probably how it was moved across the river because mm -hmm. they didn't have cranes. Right. And it takes a, takes a tremendous crane to, to uh, move a bridge that size. It's not a small feat. Mm -mm. You have to have good footing underneath the crane. It's just a, it's a more comfortable way to do it, I guess, too. You're known for covered bridge work, um, but your work extends far beyond covered bridges. You've restored churches and barns and fire towers and remote mountain huts and other his historic properties. And, I, and one of those properties was the, the Mayflower 2. How did you become involved with that project? I guess we would... Uh, chatting with Whit Perry was a captain in Mayflow and, and uh, he was talking about some of the issues they were going to have with the restoration because the, um, in the past they had not done a real uh, thorough shoring job I guess you'd call it as it turned out so I devised this method of putting beams through the gun ports and, and uh, some shoring inside and picking it up on 10 posts and then they could do whatever they wanted to with the hull. Do you have a, a favorite project other than a covered bridge? Yeah, the Shelburne Museum was quite a challenging project. It was a it was a barn over in Barnet, Vermont, round barn, a real round barn. And it was in pretty poor shape to to dismantle without it falling down, you know. A lot of shoring challenges. And then a lot of rebuilding challenges to uh replicate what was original without uh, jeopardizing the safety. Yeah, Eagle, Eagle Block was another one. We, um, the brick walls were bulging out, had been bulging out on their way for years. We had to take out the obstacles in the floor system so that we could move them back in then bore the floor system and pour concrete reinforced floor systems on top of it. So from inside, you look up now and you see the old floor system. But when you're upstairs sitting down, you're sitting on the concrete floor system. And that holds the walls seeing where they belong now. Yeah, we restored the timber frame from the fire. The whole roof system was burned. What are you working on now? A number of small projects around home here, doing those during the winter, building and barn raising foundations, that sort of thing. Some timber frame repairs. Do, do you always work year round, always working through the winter? I know some of the covered bridges you built went through the winter months. What is that like? Yeah, pretty much we work most <clears throat> through the winter. It's not quite as much fun because you're all bundled up. And 
wind usually howling over the river, whatever you have. The river makes a great path for the wind to come up through. <clears throat> Pretty much always working. I would imagine that's really challenging. It can be. Can you talk a little bit about your 1955 Ford pickup truck? Yeah. Well, I bought that in 55 when I was... Uh, it was actually delivered before I graduated from high school. It was during the same time when there was a lot of road work and a lot of buildings in the way of the new right-of-ways. And so my father had a lot of work, a lot more than he could handle. So he somehow decided to, or I decided to take over some of that. Started doing some some uh, site work on my own, then taking on some of the shoring projects and moving projects, working together with him mostly, but by myself sometimes too. Mm -hmm. Did you start working with him before you graduated from high school? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I used to do some farm building and that sort of thing. And so you, you bought the truck to help you with that process, and you still use it today, correct? Yes, yeah, still use it. We have a lot of other ones now. But. So you've you've built several brand-new covered bridges um, in, in the state, and, and one story that I really like is the story of the Stony Moral Bridge. Can you talk a little bit about how that bridge came about? It was the Folk Life Festival. New Hampshire was... Uh, chosen to represent uh, us down at the Smithsonian. So we they had some other displays too, but we, they chose us to build a covered bridge and take it down there and, and uh, work on it while we were there, sort of as a, an authentic demonstration bridge. Okay. Yeah, we built it here and trucked it down there. I, I can't imagine what people on the highway must have thought when they looked over and saw a covered bridge driving by. Did you? <laughs> did you? Yeah, it was it was a, a challenge getting through some of the towns and whatnot because they didn't they didn't want you out on the highway with it during rush hour and stuff like that because not not maybe so much as a, a hazard, but it'd be a hazard in a way that people were interested in what it was, you know. Yet we were escorted all all the way. Wow. Stock lights and things like that were, were one of the biggest things that we had to watch for because they are pretty much low mm -hmm. legal clearance all right it's usually but it, you don't know if that one's gonna hit the ridge of the bridge or the bridge hit the light so you have to Beer around it. Mm -hmm. Well, that would be a first for a bridge to hit something instead of the other way around. Right. Yeah. <laughs> a little different than what happens now. Exactly. So you you brought the the bridge to Washington, and then did you work on it as part of like an active program for people yeah. to see? Yeah, we okay. worked on a lot of the finish work. So that we'd be there to answer questions. Nice. And we told it back home up to Storyland and uh, Stony Morrow bought it. He sponsored the bridge, Big Pat, mm -hmm. anyway, but uh, he wanted it back up there. He died rather suddenly. We went down to Hoppington uh, mm -hmm. after and did our demonstration down there. And then it went over to Kennett High School for a crossing for the ball field, the athletic fields. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about your legacy of restoring covered bridges using authentic methods and your involvement with the historic American engineering record project? 
That's true. We did have the first hair project. And we did. Um, <clears throat> we did start the tradition, I guess, of authentic restorations rather than just nailing a bolt and a timber into place. It would be spliced in the traditional manner and the camber restored. So in the end, the bridge should look just like it did when the first original builder left it. And prior to you and your dad doing the bridge work in that manner, people were just fixing covered bridges the best way that they knew how they were using modern methods or. Yeah, they, you know, it wasn't all their fault. They didn't know uh, any different. You know, they mm -hmm. weren't bridge builders. Right. Yeah. Yes. We made sure that we didn't do any of the incorrect methods. We wanted to get the same bridge that the original builder had. We had been doing the, the same things that, that the Arlington Charter. Uh, well, I guess they don't, I guess they require, uh, you know, I don't know what the right term is, but we had been doing this bridges in that manner that they want for the authentic. Would you say because of the work that you and your father were, were doing, that's why the Burlington Charter was created? That was instrumental, I'm sure, because they did see that they could be, could be done correctly. I know that some, some New Hampshire covered bridges, um, and I'm thinking of Stark, um, the Stark Covered Bridge has steel under it, and obviously that's not authentic. Um, do Do you think that sometimes communities have used un inauthentic methods to preserve their bridges just to keep it, just to keep the bridge? Yeah, sometimes they have, they have to make that compromise, otherwise... Because the, the community is only putting in a small part. You know, they need the other taxpayers in the country to help out, so they mm -hmm. can't. Uh, you know, if it's a $2 million project, they can't take it on themselves. So so sometimes communities will, will compromise the the work on the bridge to, to keep in, instead of losing the bridge. Right, yeah, if okay. it has to be. The load rating has to be increased. In your father's book, The Last of the Covered Bridge Builders, he said of the New England College Bridge that it was without question the largest job that was done in New England that year without a performance bond or without a written a agreement of any kind. And can you tell us about your dad's way of doing business with a handshake and how that's changed? Nowadays, well, it has changed, of course, but yeah, he pretty much called his word his bond, and uh, I've tried to carry that out as far as it can. But you know, modern times require modern methods. We had bad guys back then, but <laughs> I'm not sure we had. The percentage was as high as it is now. Mm -hmm. but. As the funding sources grew, the paperwork grew too. <laughs> it's kind of what it seems like. The process to receive federal funding, especially, is complicated. It is, you know, uh, but it has to be because there are so many people overseeing it that have to answer, answer to someone else, I expect. It, it mm -hmm. just has to be. I can't trust everybody to do what, what they say they'll do for, for the money they get. You know, it mm -hmm. just, it's, it's just like everything. It evolves into more and more complicated. Mm -hmm. The pre-qualification thing is, is 
comes into play when you have too many contractors that are just not, they may not know what they are getting into, you know, they may not realize all the ins and outs of Covered Bridge and they might take the job and then not knowingly, but find they're not capable of uh, handling it, doing the, mostly the handwork that it takes to do a, a tight joint so that the bridge doesn't lose camber in a few months after they leave. <laughs> so the pre-qualification has to, it has to get more complicated. To be pre-qualified, do um, bridge builders have to have worked on so many covered bridge projects in the past? Do they have to have a track record? Yeah, that's supposed to be part of the qualification. In the covered bridge community, we talk about timber framers and bridge rights. Are they the same? Are they different? No, they're, they're definitely different. The bridge right mm -hmm. has to be a good timber frame for sure. But uh, a good timber frame may not have the knowledge or ability or to uh, do the necessary shoring to get his timbers in place before he does the timber frame. Got it. A master bridge right is somebody, I would assume, that has experience over a long period of time. Right. Successful experience. You have to be <laughs> responsible for the not only the project, but the money, the whole, all the responsibility has to be on your hand, your neck, or your head. Everything rides on the projects. You know, your your company is attached to you personally, to your home, to your livelihood. So it's managing it from start to finish, from the bid process to, to finishing the bridge. It, it's all tied up in in you personally being res responsible right it is you have to be bonded and to get bonded you have to have enough collateral to so that if you fail for whatever reason the bonding company can hire someone else to come in and do the job and if uh, the owner of the project didn't feel that anyone else was capable of doing the job, then uh, it's really hard to get enough collateral together to get bonded because they don't know who they're going to hire if you fail. Mm -hmm. I know the late David Fischetti was an engineer from North Carolina that you worked with on several covered bridge projects. Can you talk a little bit about him? Yeah, Dave, Dave Fischetti was uh, a real good timber engineer. He understood timber, what could be done with it. And uh, uh, between the two of us, we could figure out how to fix the bridge quite often without having to uh, incorporate uh, metal and that sort of thing. Uh, Dave and I worked together on projects from here to Georgia. Was he part of the Corbin Bridge project? Yeah, he was. He was an engineer of record. Did that process change from when you started working on, on covered bridges to have to have an engineer attached? Not quite a bit. Number one, you had to, you had to set up drawings. <laughs> you had to look at them and make sure you doing what those drawings indicate you're going to do, you know, mm -hmm. where before, if you were doing it, you'd just take a piece of timber out and uh, either duplicate that timber or duplicate the one that was in there originally if that one had been replaced, you know, mm -hmm. so it, uh, with the engineer, you have uh, probably another degree of confidence that 
what you're doing is going to carry the load that it's intended to carry. Mm -hmm. it after you get the bridge done, the engineer has to has to give it a rating. So a lot of that depends on the quality of your work and the size of timbers and that sort of thing. Speaking of of timbers, so when these when these bridges were built initially, I'm assuming that they were built with timber that was found locally. No, we had a lot of uh, what they call old growth timber, that, you know, big timber, even white pine, that is. Uh, it grew slow because it was crowded where it was you know, over many years, and it's a lot denser, a lot stronger timber than a fast-growing uh, tree. If you uh, sometimes you can look at the end of timber, and you see the growth rings are like three quarters of an inch. Well, that's a fast-growing tree. You're getting a lot of timber, but you're not getting the dense, strong timber. So okay. you have to consider that in your work. Okay. So in the, if you're working on a covered bridge here, is there, is there local timber that can be used to fix covered bridges, or is it typical to have it shipped in from somewhere else? Dependent on what what the timber is doing. If it's in, generally, if it's in compression, you can use local timber. But if it's in tension, you're probably going to have to go to the stronger species. Yeah, the lengths too. A lot of thirty-two foot timber in a covered bridge. It's hard to get thirty-two foot timber of the right size around here. Can you explain the difference between compression and tension? Well, sometimes <laughs> I say <laughs> that the tension tears things apart and when they're in compression. They're, what, what you're really doing is uh, you're pushing for the compression and you're pulling for the tension. So, And so you would need different strengths of wood for each? Yeah, yeah, because... In the compression, like in the top cords, they're in compression, so you, you're trying to shorten that timber where in the bottom cords, it's in tension, so you're trying to make it longer, so you, the fiber in the wood has to have longer fibers than what the, the top cord would have. When we shore up a bridge, too, that is important. To, it's important to relax all the joineries by by uh, taking them out of tension and compression so they're just suspended sitting there haven't really they're not working right then that way you can cut your new piece fit it in and it'll take load at the same time the old pieces take load so everybody works together Got it. if you don't get that relaxed truss, then when you put the new piece in, it's not going to take any load to start to work until the bridge settles a little bit. Mm -hmm. You don't want to settle. So if a, if a bridge is experiencing sag, that's... It's negative camber, and that's caused by usually rot in the bottom cord, so the bottom cord stretches or it could be rot in the top cord, so the top cord shrinks, gets compressed. Sometimes uh, if the joinery isn't tight enough, then when you bridge settles, it will get negative camber again, even after it's been restored, if the joinery isn't perfect. You know. Yeah, we always restore the camera before we start anything, put it. So that's putting it back in the same same configuration as it was when mm -hmm. it was originally built. It keeps all the joinery tight, all mm -hmm. working together. 
if you have too much sag in a bridge, wouldn't that reduce the load oh, yeah. capacity? Yeah, the, the, the sag only happens if the if the shears, shear blocks, and splice blocks are failing. You know, if those uh, the joinery has taken in too much load, and that happens when you get rock on one end, then that joint will fail and it puts too much load on others and pretty soon they just can't handle it. Mm -hmm. They handle a lot, but they can't handle it. They can't do the job all by themselves. So somebody's got right. to help them. Right. So when you, when you take a bridge out of, out of tension, do you, I would assume that you have to have some type of shoring underneath. A lot. And what what is that process like when you when you are dealing with a waterway? Well, I started using a, a tr truss, the metal truss through the through the bridge. I guess fifteen years ago, something I've been wanting to do for a long time, never had the opportunity. You know, because it takes a a lot of money to build the trust and install it and that sort of thing. But mm -hmm. we finally did get a chance to with Dave Fischetti down in Kentucky on Johnson Creek Bridge was the second bridge I worked on with, with down there. And uh, what it is it it's just a steel trust put it through the bridge. You have to, you know, it's a lot to putting it through because the bridge can't carry the load of the steel truss. You, you've got to uh, suspend it and put it through from the shore without it touching the bridge. Balance and counterweight on the back. And, and, uh, so there's quite a bit to it. But once you get that in, installed, the needle beams on top of that, up under the top cord so that you can adjust the camber and uh, then you have a real stable backbone to, to do all your work. You can take any any piece of the wooden bridge out that you want to and the others stay in place. Okay. So you take it out, you make a duplicate of it and put it back in. You're hanging it from the top cords. And so all your lower cords and all your diagonals and that sort of thing all loose. We, we've done that on Blair and three other bridges now. I think five bridges total. It looks like a lot of work to start with, but it just simplifies things, you know. Mm -hmm. What would be a downside of working in the river and shoring up the bridge using cribbing? Sometimes we'd lose all our cribbing. Mm. Then it got so that uh, they didn't want you in, in the river at all. Yeah, with the steel truss, you don't need to. You can avoid all right. those permit processes. And well, and you, you, you tell me a story about um, the Bartlett Bridge that the water rose up and took a lot of that cribbing away, I think. Yeah, it clean, cleaned us out for sure. More ways than one. We had, I think, we had nearly two thousand pieces that we lost on that. Wow! And uh, we, we, a week or so later, we went down where it was in the fields. And you could see the one forty-foot timber was sticking up like flagpole out of a pile of timber and old trees and whatnot, you know, and we thought about going and getting that, but then we thought, well, you're going to chop up the farmer's field, you know, he's got enough to do now just to clean the field anyway, but then after you get done chopping up the farmer's field, you get out there and you pull the timber out and you find it's broken in two anyway, so, you know, you didn't have right. to push much. So. Right. So the folks down at the dam, they cleaned a lot of stuff out of the trash racks and they brought us back to pick up a little bit clock and because I had my initials on it so they knew where it came from. Wow. How does it how does it feel for you and, and I to to 
have created such amazing covered bridge masterpieces for the for the state. How how does that? Do you ever think about that or? It's very satisfying to know you have completed those unusual projects. The impact that you've had on the Carver Bridge community is is huge, and um, and it's and it's it's a legacy. Um, yeah, well, I'm, I'm grateful that the folks that have been involved have allowed me to do these things. Well, and they're very grateful for you as well. Covered Bridges of New Hampshire is created by me and recorded in Hancock, New Hampshire. The song Old New Hampshire was arranged and performed by Josh Black. The introduction is courtesy of Greg Kretschmar. This podcast is a companion to my book, Covered Bridges of New Hampshire. You can find out more about the book, the podcast, blog posts, upcoming events, and an interactive covered bridge map at coveredbridgesnh.com. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Covered Bridges of New Hampshire. Please rate, review, and subscribe to or follow the podcast on Apple, Spotify, Amazon Music, iHeartRadio, or wherever you get your podcasts. I'm Kim Chandler. Thanks for listening. Mm-hmm.